Ever notice how some days you're unstoppable at work while other days you can barely keep your eyes open after lunch? Well, here's how elite performers use the science of chrononutrition to outperform the competition. Now, I'm Rian Doris, co-founder and CEO of the Flow Research Collective. We've trained everyone from Audi Accenture to the US Air Force to use neuroscience-based principles to access states of flow and profound peak performance at will. During my teen years in Ireland, I was an athlete, surfing for hours a day and was poised for a rugby career, like my little brother who ended up competing in the Rugby World Cup. Then one summer in Croatia, on holidays with my family, I somersaulted off the bottom of a 100-foot vertical water slide and collided headfirst into concrete. My brain and spine absorbed the impact, cushioning me just enough to keep my neck from snapping. I survived, but incurred a brutal head injury. My teen years evaporated in a blur of brain fog and bed-bound fatigue. My days were defined by the miserable three Fs, Facebook scrolling, food binging, and watching reruns of the TV show Friends. During the long and slow, arduous recovery process, I lost my physique and became increasingly frustrated at the state of my body and brain. In particular, exercising wasn't an option at all because anytime I did it, it would re-trigger the head injury symptoms, brain fog, blurred vision, crippling fatigue and depression. And I was examined by dozens of doctors and specialists all weighing in with their unique approach to help me get better. Now, thankfully, I finally got better from my bedbound state and was at least able to go back to school. Then I started noticing, once back at school, this correlation between what I ate at the cafeteria and my ability to laser focus through my classes afterwards. At my school, we had a Catholic tradition called Fish Fridays. Fried piece of cod with a monstrous amount of mashed potatoes, followed by a Friday treat, usually Madeira cake and ice cream. And for whatever reason, on days when I ate meals like this, my head would fall through the desk with fatigue and brain fog in my next class. And I'm sure you can relate. You know those days when you're working away, but by noon, cravings gnaw at you. You go to the fridge and think, screw it, and decide to eat the leftover Thai food from the night before and then bam your focus crumbles energy plummets and mood flatlines well this cycle of cravings consumption and descent into lethargy is known as lunch brain it's the ultimate momentum killer now i started to see lunch brain as just part of the business of being human then one day i arrived late to the cafeteria for lunch and almost all the food was gone except for a portion of the beef steak that was being served so i ate that went back to class and boom my cognition was dramatically clearer and more optimal through the remainder of the day at school. Now, a week later, as part of the dozens of specialists I was seeing, I had an appointment with a nutritionist. This was a guy who was absolutely convinced food was medicine and that he could cure the remaining head injury symptoms through diet alone. Unfortunately, this didn't happen. The debilitating symptoms did last for years after, but this nutritionist taught me something that has lasted to this day, which is that ideally, you have two kinds of meals in life meals that you eat for fuel and meals that you eat as part of some kind of ritual. The first type of meal has one goal, to fuel your body and brain for energy focus and flow state. The flow state being that state of deep absorption and immersion in the task at hand, where you're in the zone, where cognition and creativity are at their peak, where we're fully absorbed in the task and we're able to produce our best work. The second type of meal, suited for rituals can have many goals from the pure pleasure of delicious food, celebration, belonging, connection with others, etc. Now thinking back to what I was experiencing at school, I thought, wait a second, I was eating a ritual meal in the middle of the day when all I needed was fuel for focus and flow. After this nutritionist explained these two types of meals, I realized that I had been mashing them together in an unhealthy blend. Almost every bit of food I ate was for the pleasure that it gave me, since it was helping me to cope with the head injury. The problem was, it was blocking me from flow. I realized then that it's easy to think you can't get into flow because you're tired or don't have discipline or didn't get enough sleep. But the real problem here is there's a fundamental inconsistency that we see over and over again. Most knowledge workers claim to value focus and creativity, and yet they act like dopamine gluttons. They put craving, hunger, and boredom ahead of flow state. The reality is that you can get everything else right when it comes to flow proneness. You can have your phone off, have your calendar cleared, and be poised to focus for hours on end. But then despite all of this preparation multiple times per day, we unintentionally block flow through the simple act of eating. And this problem is particularly bad because by default, based on evolution and the environment we live in, our bodies and brains will put food before flow. They will put calories ahead of optimal cognition. You can count on this. Our brains are wired to prioritize immediate survival needs like finding food, but modern foods hijack this ancient survival instinct, spiking dopamine and drowning out the quieter rewards of deep focus. 
And this mismatch between our ancient wiring and modern environment means you have to actively get your biology to work for you instead of against you. And this is the way of the workplace Olympian who puts flow ahead of food. The workplace Olympian knows that their tendency to access flow and focus for hours on end with consistent energy is massively dependent on feeding patterns. Now, what's the link between peak performance and food? And why is it so important to prioritize flow above food? Well, it's simple. And you've no doubt heard it before, insulin. It turns out your blood sugar has a surprising amount to do with getting into flow state and with staying there. Imagine your brain operates like a high performance sports car in a race. Flow state is when it's zooming at full speed, perfectly navigating every turn. The fuel for this race car is glucose, the sugar derived from food. Insulin is like your pit crew, ensuring fuel gets to your brain in just the right amounts. After you eat, insulin swings into action. It helps get sugar out of your blood and into your cells where it's used for energy. You need that sugar for sharp focus, which is exactly what flow requires. But here's the catch. Too much sugar floods your system with insulin. This happens because a sudden spike in your blood sugar triggers a corrective response. Your body wants to maintain proper balance. The pancreas goes into overdrive, releasing a surge of insulin to push that excess sugar out of your blood and into cells. But this overcorrection can cause your blood sugar to crash just as quickly. Your blood sugar crashes, your engine sputters, and suddenly you're out of fuel. Flow gets compromised, and now you're just foggy and tired. There isn't research to confirm this empirically yet, but our hypothesis is this. Just as there's a psychological sweet spot for flow, there may also be a physiological one. Psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi discovered the flow channel, where a task's challenge level perfectly matches your skill level. And this leads to full engagement, deep immersion, and ultimately flow state. If the task is too easy, you'll get bored, too difficult, and you'll become anxious. We believe there could be a similar channel for blood sugar levels. Straying outside this ideal range will cause energy peaks and crashes, disrupting the mental stability and prolonged focus we need to be able to emerge into a flow state. Think of this as the blood sugar flow channel, an ideal range for peak performance. The key is finding the sweet spot for your blood sugar. You want a steady energy supply to sustain focus, just like your car needs steady fuel to maintain top speed. Now, the good news is that there's a simple and direct way to achieve optimal blood sugar levels and to put flow ahead of food, mastering chrononutrition. Chrononutrition is an emerging field of study that examines the powerful links between our circadian rhythms, our body's internal clock, cognition, and overall health. Our circadian rhythms govern numerous bodily functions, including digestion, metabolism, hormone release. And these rhythms operate on a roughly 24-hour cycle. Chrononutrition suggests that aligning our eating patterns with those internal rhythms optimizes our body's ability to metabolize nutrients. And chrononutrition research has revealed that while the foods we choose are important, the timing of those meals also has a dramatic effect on our blood sugar levels and thus our downstream focus and performance. The first step to harnessing chrononutrition so you can access flow state more reliably and for longer is to discern between flow meals and ritual meals. Now, after learning the difference between these two types of meals from that nutritionist, I stopped eating ritual meals during the day and saved them for dinners with my family or weekend celebrations. The rest of the day, I'd only have meals that gave me fuel when needed based on the guidelines the nutritionist gave me. Within days, I felt dramatically better. I was still able to enjoy food and actually enjoyed it even more than I used to. And I stopped feeling so chronically bogged down. I had more energy, which made it easier to tolerate the long road to recovery with my head injury. And I had discovered the first pillar of chrononutrition for flow, flow meals. Remember, the workplace Olympian always follows the rule, flow before food. So the first key to sticking to this rule is to differentiate between flow meals and ritual meals. The average knowledge worker is a dopamine glutton and they mash these types of meals together without thinking, just like I did as a teen. These meals are distinct from what's in them, how you cook them and when and why you eat them. Flow meals have one goal, which is to fuel your brain to produce the neurochemistry required to access flow state. Ritual meals can have many goals, from enjoyment, celebration, belonging, connection with others, etc. When it comes to flow meals, for peak performance, it's best if you automate them. Eat the same thing every day at the same time or pick a rotation that works for you. Just make sure they're serving the purpose maximally, keeping your metabolic fitness high and fueling your brain for flow. If you have to decide what to eat for the meal, then the meal is contrary to its purpose. It becomes a distraction from the work, an opportunity to deplete your willpower and lose cognitive energy from decision fatigue and more. As for the ritual meals, you can have a ritual meal every day if you want. Just make sure you're wise about when you time it. For most, it'll be dinner, 
to seal the day after you've already finished your work and used up your flow state. If you're a night owl, the ritual should be earlier in the day before your prime time cognition. Personally, I like to stick to flow meals all week long and then only have ritual meals on weekends. Some almost only do flow meals. Ritual meals only happen on rare and special occasions for Christmas or Easter or whatever holidays you celebrate. Now, how often you have ritual meals is up to you, but one thing's for sure and good to be aware of. The more you optimize for flow meals over ritual meals, the more flow and peak performance you will get. The question now then is what exactly should you eat for your flow meals to boost your energy levels and give you more flow? Well, the first option is to eat nothing. This is something I also discovered as a teen. A few years after sticking to flow meals, the head injury symptoms were starting to clear, but a lot of the cognitive deficits were still lingering. Learning was still extremely hard and it made me feel like I was falling way behind. Then one day in college, I came across the literature on intermittent fasting on the internet. Now, intermittent fasting seems obvious, but back then I had to find out about it on the old bodybuilding.com forums. Some people were swearing by it, making miraculous claims about how it repairs cells through autophagy, boosts brain health and mental clarity, and lowers insulin levels. When you fast, your body shifts from lying on glucose to tapping into fat stores for energy, which improves blood sugar regulation, capable of putting the body and brain in the sweet spot for flow state. Fasting trains your body to untether energy from cognition and from food intake. That is, you no longer rely on food for either energy or cognition with fasting. Now, these online strangers mentioned that for the first few days of fasting, you'll be hungry to the point of it being distracting and potentially have even worse focus. I thought, that's no problem. I'm already unable to focus anyway. I was sold on it the moment I heard it could help with mental clarity. So I tried it out. And what I found was that while it was true that for the first few days, I definitely had food cravings, but by day three, the cravings dipped. This is because fasting helps balance out a hormone called ghrelin, which controls and regulates hunger levels. When ghrelin levels are stable, your body gets better at knowing when you're truly hungry versus just wanting to eat out of habit. You won't feel the urge to chow down just because it's lunchtime, you're stressed, or because you smell something delicious. Instead, hunger signals will line up more with when your body really needs food. This leads to less hunger overall, allowing for longer periods of uninterrupted work without energy dips. Then, as I continued to fast by day four, I was utterly stunned by the mental state that came about when in a fasted mode. Rather than groggy and caffeine-fueled during my undergrad in college, I had this clear, expansive consciousness. It almost felt like I had a new brain. My thoughts felt like they could move more rapidly, traveling faster around my neuronal circuitry. Over time, fasting can improve metabolic health by promoting better regulation of hunger hormones and insulin, leading to improved blood sugar control. You get to the point where you're metabolically fit enough for food to be necessary as a day-to-day -day energy source, but no longer necessary as an hour-to-hour -hour energy source. So I had discovered the second pillar of chrononutrition for flow, and that was fasting. And from then on to this day, I practice intermittent fasting, not just for health, but primarily for peak performance and flow. And there are two main ways we suggest getting started with intermittent fasting. The first is a 24-hour fast. Once a week, choose a day to abstain from food for a full 24 hour period, from dinner one day until dinner the following day. The second is time restricted fasting. This is when you consume a day's worth of calories during a four to 12 hour block during each 24 hour cycle, and then you fast the remaining 12 to 20 hours. A common approach is the 16 8 method, where you fast for 16 hours and eat during an eight hour window. This also helps you to align eating times with circadian rhythms, which can help improve sleep and overall metabolic functions. This fasting period allows insulin levels to decrease. So start maybe with an eight hour eating window, finish eating at 8 p.m. and then restart eating at noon the next day. This makes it easy to see if fasting works for you. And here's a peak performance fasting tip. To amplify the benefit of being in a fasted state, one of the simplest, most high leverage flow hacks known to man is to drink three liters of water and take 100 to 200 milligrams of caffeine and two to 400 milligrams of L-theanine with no food from when you wake up to about midday in a given day. This is a super easy wave of the magic wand way to drop yourself into flow state and get more done in a few hours than most do in an entire day. And it's also a nice way to show how much of a difference food or the lack thereof can make to the cognition that gets you into flow state. Now, while fasting, don't forget to take advantage of one of the only ways to get smarter in 30 seconds, which is free. And we're talking water, which is critical. Keep a one to three coffee to water ratio. Aim for clear urine, and remember to get your electrolytes in as well. Now, the next question for dialing in the three pillars of chrononutrition for flow is, 
when should you break your fast? Well, that gets to food timing. As I continued my journey out of the head injury and into recovery, I had moved up and out of college and started interning for a number of companies. By then, my workday had expanded. This was a whole different level than in college. While in college, when I was fasting for the first half of the day, it was easy to be super productive with that creative consciousness and effortless access to flow state. But over time, as my responsibility grew, I needed that level of consciousness for the entire day. However, by lunchtime, I would get so hungry that my focus and energy would drop. So I would eat, but it would remove the fasted state and give me the dreaded lunch brain, causing a huge dip in performance right in the middle of the day. Then one week, a friend of mine left a bunch of Soho at steaks from an event he'd put on in the fridge. The steaks all had to be eaten within the next few days. So for lunch, instead of the salad, fruit, and eggs that I'd usually eat, I did the obvious thing. I cooked up a few of the steaks. Then something strange happened, or more accurately, something didn't happen in that I didn't feel any discernible drop in my energy levels whatsoever. I was able to plow forward with work immediately after lunch without skipping a beat, lunch brain non-existent. The next day, I did the same thing. Cooked up one of the leftover steaks for lunch, the same thing happened. It was as if the fasted state cognition was completely unaffected by the meal, despite the fact that I had ingested calories, which allowed me to continue to access flow throughout the rest of the day just as well as I could in a fasted state. I had accidentally discovered the third pillar of chrononutrition for flow, which is food timing. Part of the reason food timing is so important is because your body has a chronotype, a daily peak performance window that's coded into your biology. This is an internal body clock that controls when you feel most awake and when you feel tired during the day. For most people, there's a dip or a trough in energy levels around 3 p.m. To avoid feeling even more drained in the afternoon, don't eat lunch during this low energy period. Instead, have a nutritious flow meal earlier in the day when you're in your peak chronotype zone. This will help keep your energy steadier as the peak level of energy you're in, determined by your chronotype, will offset the lunch brain that you may get if you eat during a trough in your energy. So if you skip breakfast and get super hungry, you'll have no choice but to eat during your afternoon trough. That'll make you crash even harder. So fuel up at the right times to work with instead of against your chronotype. Now, after fasting, with more work still ahead of you in the day, what should you eat? Well, that brings us to finding your high flow foods. Now, first, remember the rule, flow before food. That means that the goal of the fuel meal is to have your brain pump out more hours of flow state. To that end, let's find your high flow foods. When determining your high flow foods, it's helpful to think of your brain as a garden. The quality of the soil, your diet, determines the health of the plants, your neurons, and their yield. Your thoughts, emotions, creativity, insights, decisions. Just as a gardener carefully selects the right fertilizer for a lush harvest, we can nourish our brains with the right foods to cultivate a rich, fertile ground for flow state. We can actively enhance our cognitive landscape, enabling us to reach our full potential. A simple way to do this that works 90% of the time is subjective. Simply pay attention to how you feel and how you perform after various foods that you consume. If you notice your energy dipping or it being harder to focus, avoid that food in your flow meals. If you notice your energy surging with your focus being unimpeded, keep eating that food in your flow meals. I realized that for me personally, I could sustain the flow proneness of the fasted state if I ate carnivore only. That means nothing but salmon or fish, steak or some kind of meat and eggs. As for what high flow foods we suggest for you, we don't wanna take any dietary positions here. If you do an elimination diet of some kind, it can help you determine foods that are hindering your flow state without you knowing it. It's possible you are unable to tolerate dairy, sugar, gluten, histamine, red meat. With an elimination diet, you strip out almost everything so that you can identify the culprit. Once identified, you leave these things out of your flow meals. But the key is to split test things for yourself and see what gives you optimal cognition. For some people, it might be a light vegan meal or a plate of watermelon or a ribeye steak. I have a friend who finds that what's optimal for him is literally eating a full plate of apples, three to five apples for lunch. And his state is unimpeded, he can sustain flow. For me, it's eating carnivore, having a steak. For you, maybe it's salad. The point is, split test it yourself and see what food you can ingest that results in your focus being uninterrupted. For me, after realizing I could sustain the flow proneness of the fasted state, if I ate carnivore only, I realized I only needed to have a carnivore meal at lunch to sustain flow. After work, I can have carbs, down-regulate from the day, regulate the nervous system, and shift gears into the evening. This transition to carbohydrates later in the day can support serotonin production, which is a nice bonus for extra relaxation too. 
Now, putting all of this together took 10 years, but I had pinpointed the three pillars of how to use chrono nutrition for flow. Fasting, finding high flow foods for your flow meals, and then food timing. Now, if you're worried about your diet becoming imbalanced when eliminating foods, to identify your high flow fuel meals, you can run an N of one experiment to determine what ingredients should go in your flow meals. To do this, you can track your blood sugar with a continuous glucose monitor. This allows you to split test foods and actually see with data what you respond best to. It will show you what foods are driving blood sugar crashes because sometimes food isn't the cause. Stress, caffeine, or variables with exercise can be the cause, even being underslept. But don't overthink this. It's easy to become obsessed with the long tail of diet and forget the basics, the fundamentals. When this happens, it leads to nutritional neurosis. I saw a hilarious example of this with a biohacking friend of mine. He was cooking dinner once in East LA. I was over at his house and he pulled out a timer at a thermometer and started boiling broccoli sprouts. I asked him what the thermometer was for. He said, what, you don't know? He saw my puzzled look and then said something like, well, in order for the broccoli sprouts to activate optimal sulfaphrane levels and deactivate sulfaphrane nitrile, the sprouts have to be boiled to precisely 158 degrees Fahrenheit for exactly 10 minutes. Boy, was I schooled. Then, while boiling the broccoli, followed over a dozen pills for digestion, bile production, blood sugar regulation, prebiotics, probiotics, all the biotics you can imagine. The scene was one of stressful simultaneity, counting pills while fussing with the measuring stick while minding the temperature of the broccoli. The irony was he hadn't slept enough the night before. He hadn't worked out in a week. He hadn't stretched or been out in nature that day. And I realized then that sometimes biohacking involves majoring in minor things. This nutritional neuroses often makes optimal health infinitely more complex than it needs to be. Instead, focus on three things. The right macro intake for you, calories, and then the breakdown of fat, carbs, and protein. The right micro intake through whole foods and avoiding foods that you are intolerant to. And then finally, avoiding foods that you're intolerant to or that don't make you feel good. Micronutrients come from nutrient-dense foods that give your body the nourishment it needs to function optimally. To shortcut, your micronutrient intake, make yourself a micro bomb. That is, make a smoothie that's absolutely loaded with micronutrients. Keep a half dozen vegetables in your freezer at all times for this purpose, but be sure to avoid common anti-nutrients like oxalates, often put in smoothies found in foods like spinach, berries, cacao, and nuts. That way, no matter what happens with the rest of your meals that day, your bases are completely covered. Now, having these three pillars in place, fasting, food timing, and high flow meals, made a world of a difference for me when I first hopped on the path of flow and peak performance. And I've distilled all three of these pillars and principles into a single printout you can use to help you master putting flow before food. To download it, just click the link in the description. Now, before I could fully realize the benefits of these three pillars of chrono nutrition, there was something else I had to do first, and that was to get lean. After the food, Facebook, and friends binging misery in my teenage years, I was bogged down by all the weight that I'd gained. This excess weight was messing with my insulin sensitivity and thus throwing me out of the blood sugar sweet spot for flow. Now, common wisdom would intuitively tell you that it's better off to eat healthy food even if you're a little bit overweight. But in reality, it's not that simple. If you actually look at research around excess body fat, it can have just as much of a negative impact on your blood markers and thus health as eating unhealthy food. Now, while neither is ideal, being lean is a critical component in having good health, just as important, maybe more than actually eating clean. Now, why is this? Well, because leanness promotes flow proneness and its opposite blocks it. Particularly, excess weight exacerbates the flow blockers. Excess weight causes excess stress in the central nervous system and cognitive function, including attention, executive function, decision-making, learning, and memory, all vital for tapping into and maximizing flow state. And excess weight can also block long-term peak performance. Meta-analyses show that obesity doubles the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Obesity in midlife predicts a greater risk of dementia in later life, which indirectly attacks the brain's ability to sustain flow state. Now, of course, I didn't know that at the time, and without an understanding of this science, my teen years were plagued with a binge diet loop. I heard from the online forums that eating eight meals a day was the best way to jack up your metabolism. So I would have these miserable little tiny meals of canned tuna and raw veggies or grilled chicken with no sauce it was horrible. I was so hungry all the time, the diet was so strict that I was never able to eat a satisfying meal and reach any level of satiety. So I'd fall off the wagon over and over, binge eating a massive meal, feeling like crap afterwards. This was made so much worse because I couldn't exercise without exacerbating the symptoms of the head injuries. So it seemed the only way 
I was going to lose the excess weight I'd gained was to starve my way out. It got so bad, I once even had a bulimic moment. There's this horrible feeling if you overeat after having spent two, three weeks or a month dieting and making progress, where you feel like you've wiped away weeks and weeks of disciplined progress. And one time it was so overwhelmingly painful that I actually made myself get sick. I dealt with this kind of struggle for years, but then I learned that I didn't need to exercise to get lean after all. After finally better understanding the science of nutrition and peak performance, I realized it's possible to get and stay lean in a far easier way than I was attempting to with these three things. The first is simple, 10,000 steps a day. A study published in the Journal of Obesity showed that participants who increased their step count to 10,000 steps a day experienced significant weight loss and improvements in cardiovascular health without necessarily changing their diet. This suggests that regular moderate physical activity like walking can be an effective component of a weight management strategy. A meta-analysis of appetite perception showed that walking generally has a neutral or even appetite suppressive effect while also decreasing stress hormones like cortisol. This creates a calmer mental environment more conducive to achieving flow state and staying disciplined with food intake. And it's a suitable way to burn calories without triggering overeating as a compensation mechanism. This is contrasted to high intensity exercise where you go out, you sweat like crazy for an hour, but then your appetite is spiked and you feel like you've just exerted a tremendous amount, which justifies overeating psychologically. Now, research also suggests that achieving 10,000 steps a day isn't just about weight loss. Walking promotes blood flow to the brain, enhances neurotransmitter function, and stimulates the growth in your brain cells, all boosting the mental faculties we need for focus in the flow that follows. And whether you eat a flow meal or ritual meal, here's a rule to keep the flow going. Simple, walk after eating always. Walking after a meal improves digestion, increases energy levels, and lowers blood sugar. The low-grade physical activity of walking can also lead to transient hyperfrontality, a temporary down-regulation of the prefrontal cortex, which is a neurological characteristic of flow state. This can make it easier to get back into flow after eating. Now, second, you wanna eat veggie bowls. One of the biggest levers we have in determining how much weight we gain or lose is calories in, calories out. Of course, the way your body metabolizes certain types of calories, your caloric burn rate and other factors play a role too. But the biggest lever we can pull is simply getting the balance of calories in right versus calories out. Make it easy to track your calories by eating roughly the same amount of calories per fuel meal. This is important because it's easy to over or under eat. Tracking caloric intake mitigates binging and prevents diet-related stress because even if we eat poorly, we can still stay within a calorie range. It limits black or white, all or nothing thinking where you spill on your diet a little bit and then think, okay, the day is ruined, I'm gonna throw the baby out with the bathwater. So instead, determine your daily calorie intake by tracking and gauging your weight. Now for context, a pound of fat is 3,600 calories. So to lose a pound a week, you need a deficit of this weekly, about 500 calories a day. To make this even easier, ensure what you eat is a high volume food. And this is where we get back to the point of eating veggie bowls, high volume, low calorie foods, stabilize blood sugar, preventing the crashes and energy dips that disrupt focus and derail flow. For example, a big bowl of veggies. Research from Pennsylvania State University published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition found that high volume, low energy density foods lead to greater satiety and reduced calorie intake. High volume foods are those that have large volumes of size relative to their calorie content, like delicious salads and plates of vegetables and whole foods. They're typically low in calories, but high in water and fiber, which gives them the ability to fill up the stomach and create a feeling of fullness while consuming fewer calories. Do this and the pounds will disappear and you'll be able to access previously inaccessible levels of peak performance. What I like to optimize for is the best ratio of chew time, chewing the food, to calories consumed. The more chewing, the less calories, the better it is psychologically and from a satiety perspective. Now, if you eat healthy, unprocessed foods, you'll feel more satiated. Whereas we are evolutionarily driven to gorge on fat and sugar, which drives overeating. Eating clean leads to more energy, which leads to more calories burned, which leads to the benefits of being lean, which leads to the desire to continue to eat clean. So a virtuous cycle gets created. So avoid foods that are easy to binge or that are super high in calories, but low in satiety, like many oils. Now, one of my first jobs in LA was when I worked at a surf shop on the beach for this really lovely woman who set me up with the gig. At the time though, she was trying to watch what she ate and trying to lose weight by shrinking her portion size. However, she ritualistically drank 16 full sugar cans of Coca-Cola every single day. That's 140 calories each, totaling 2000 calories in a day. If all she did was switch those cans to Coke Zero, she would have lost weight at a rapid rate. So the rule here is, 
don't drink calories. This is easy to do with soda, coffee, and alcohol. Third, you want a six hour daily feeding window. Narrowing your feeding window reduces opportunities for overeating, increases satiety, and gives you peace of mind. Because when you do eat, you get to eat as if you're not on a diet. You get to have a standard or even large meal. So psychologically, the association with food and abundance is still present, although on a 24 hour cycle, your calorie intake is limited. Now, long fasts periodically can also be really helpful to reduce your total monthly calorie intake to keep you lean. For example, if your base intake for staying lean is 3000 calories per day, and you do a 48 hour fast twice a month, you're saving 12,000 calories worth of food a month. As a huge bonus, a narrower eating window limits constant food related decisions freeing up cognitive resources for focused work and entry into flow. Now in short, to get and stay lean for flow, walk 10,000 steps a day and eat high volume, satiating flow meals within a six hour time frame and avoid anything high calorie and high palatability from drinking soda to scoops full of peanut butter. Now bear in mind, our bodies are evolutionarily adapted for flow. Our prehistoric ancestors survival hinged on it. Brains laser focused on each spear thrust, senses heightened to subtle signals in the brush. Those who achieve flow would have been better at acquiring and mastering skills, which were then passed down to their kin. Activities like hunting, foraging, and tool making all required intense focus, quick decision making, and skillful execution, all of which are enhanced by flow state. Now consider the quality of your consciousness and the frequency with which you determine the quality of your consciousness by food. Over your lifetime, this amounts to a significant alteration of your consciousness from food choices alone. By putting flow before food, you retain control over your consciousness rather than letting the food you eat and the unintentionality around the decisions of what to eat determine the state of consciousness you're in. When you choose flow before food, you flip the script that runs most dopamine gluttons. Instead of the body being a burden, it becomes your biggest lever on productivity, creativity, and accomplishment. Now, food is one way to amplify or hinder flow, but there's another substance, something many of us consume every single day that if used well, can directly trigger flow, while if misused, can lead to a downward spiral of suboptimal performance. To learn how to master usage of this substance, click on the video on screen now.